Okay, we now have a podcast on the intro to genetics. You should have a lecture sheet. Um, toward the end, we'll be covering some terms that are not on the sheet. I would strongly recommend that you writing those down. Okay, two scientists you need to be familiar with for this unit. Uh, first one is Gregor Mendel, and he is known as the father of genetics. He did all of his observations on the garden pea plant, and he really focused on seven traits. Of course, we talk a lot about uh, the tall and the short offspring, so I will reference the height of the plants, but he had seven traits that he focused on. And I will come back to this, but I just want to point out, uh, we'll look at generations, what does F1, F2 mean, genotype, phenotype, but when he crossed a tall and a short plant, he got a predicted outcome of three tall plants and one short. What he did not see is that two of the four possible outcome or of the plants that were tall actually carried a recessive trait, um, a lowercase t. So this is going to be important when we start looking at dominance and recessiveness. Okay, here are the seven traits. He looked at how did the pod look? Was it inflated or constricted? The color of the seed, yellow versus green. Was it a tall plant, a short plant? Was the seed round or did it look all wrinkled and shriveled up? Were the flowers purple or white? Was the pods green versus yellow? And then finally the position of the flower. Was it axial on the stem right here or was it at the tip of the stem which is called terminal? So those are the seven traits. Some other terms you need to be aware of um, sometimes people use these terms interchangeably, uh, inheritance and heredity. Inheritance, passing of traits by heredity, and inheritance, transmission of traits from the parent to the offspring. So you're really just going to have to memorize how those are worded so you don't get those confused. We also have pure and strain. If something is pure, a particular trait in a parent will be passed down to the offspring. And I know you've heard of a purebred dog, a purebred horse. Strain are the species, all the species for a specific trait. Now, a lot of time people will use the word pure when we're referring to animals, traits that pertain to animals, and strain when we're talking about those plants. Okay, so now that we're on plants, let's look at pollination. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther, which is the male reproductive structure, to the stigma, which is the female reproductive structure. So if we go to the classic cross-section of a flower, we'll point out a few of the parts. First we have the stamen. Men, that's how you can remember that. This is the male parts. Here's the anther. The anther are these little structures at the tip of the stalk called the filament. This anther is what has all those pollen grains. So if you have allergies, that's what you're allergic to. The female structure, carpal, is made up of the stigma. We had mentioned that the stigma has the female. It's actually sticky on top. So when those pollen grains are flying around, they stick. Then they'll fall down this tube called the style, and they'll end up in the ovary and fertilize one of these ovules. So kind of a silly way to remember that mom, soccer mom's carpool, so carpal, kind of a silly way to remember it. Okay, two types of pollination. We have self and we have cross. Self-pollination is within the same plant. So here I can see the pollen from one anther is falling down the stigma down to the ovules. Cross-pollination would be between two plants. I can go either direction. And lots of times scientists will hand cross-pollinate two flowers to get a hybrid or a new type of flower. Okay, we also have P1, F1, F2. So these are some symbols you need to be familiar with and also there will be a fill in the blank question. You need to know what does F1, F2, P1 stand for. P stands for parent, one is first, so the first parental generation. F stands for filial, superscript one, first. Here's filial, two, second filial generation. So if I was to put these together, I would say that the P1 in this situation are the grandparents, 
F1 are the kids, F2 grandkids. Okay, now based on Mendel's three, okay, sorry about that, I got interrupted. So what I was saying is that Mendel, based on his observations from the garden pea plant, he came up with three principles, sometimes they'll say three laws. So he came up with, there's dominance and recessiveness, tall, short, that's just one of the seven traits. Segregation, we'll look at that in just a second, and independent assortment. So dominance and recessiveness, recessiveness is when one trait masks or covers up another trait. So I pointed out earlier, even though I have these two plants are tall, it is covering up or masking that short trait, that short allele. So I still have three tall plants and one short, even though two of the three tall are carrying the recessive trait. Segregation. Segregation refers to when I form eggs and sperm. Spermatogenesis, oogenesis, we've covered in the last chapter. So when these segregate out, each cell will get one factor for each characteristic. So we'll actually assign some letters in the chromosomes and hopefully you can see that a little bit better for the definition. Independent assortment is talking about, again, the reproductive cells, but in this case, they are independent of each other, which means that factors are not connected. So for example, we may know some people that in a population that have blonde hair and blue eyes and they usually show up together. But I bet you know someone that has blonde hair and brown eyes. So even though we see that a lot, blonde hair and blue eyes, those two traits are not connected. They are independent of each other, independent assortment. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't some traits that are linked, that's just one example of them not being linked. Okay, our second scientist is Walter Sutton. And what he did, he had his observations about meiosis, and he took what Mendel had written up in his journals on the three principles, and he came up with what is known as the chromosome theory. Now, I've thrown in a little fun fact about um, Sutton and his association with Kansas. Okay, so let's look how these three principles of Mendel link together with what Sutton had. So, this should look familiar. We have meiosis one and meiosis two. So, if I looked at heterozygous diploid, so here's my two heterozygous trait, diploid, two traits, I could go one of two directions depending on how the homologous chromosomes line up on the spindle fiber. If they lined up this way, so if I look at the color, here are my blue chromosomes. If I look at this side, if it went this direction, now they're across from one another. So let's go with the left. So here are my homologous chromosomes, my two Y's lined up and my two R's. When they segregate out, I can follow the path and I can see my possible haploid gametes, big R, little y. And notice where it comes from, big R, little y. And the same thing here. And then if I follow this down, here's my big Y, little r and it will go all the way down my possible gametes. If the homologous chromosomes lined up this way, where I have little y, big Y, little r, big R, just by switching those two around, now I can see, now it segregates out little y, little r for these two possible gametes, or big Y, big R for these two possible. So that's how the law of segregation, they segregate out during gamete formation. Law of independent assortment, depending on the path it took, I can see this possible gamete has a big R, little y. If I went this direction, I could have a big R and a big Y. So they are not linked to one another in any way. Okay, some other terms you need to know. I've used the term allele and gene. These are two different terms. Do not get those interchangeable. Don't, they're not the same thing. Alleles, they always occur in pairs, like everything else. An allele will code for the same trait, and they are located at the same place on the chromosome. So you can see here that they are directly across from one another. Genes are different traits, different parts of the chromosome. So for example, I could have hair color and eye color, 
two different. If I was to look at it as a allele, this would be hair color. Okay, so one may be dominant, brown, one may be blue. But if I was looking at eyes, not hair color. <laughs> okay, some symbols. You notice we've used capital letters, lowercase letters. So the capital letter is the dominant, and the recessive, we use a lowercase. Now I've already said this, that everything occurs in pairs. So chromosomes occur in pairs, genes occur in pairs, alleles occur in pairs. So pairs, 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 everything. So here's my chromosome, here's my DNA, my twisted double helix, and here is a segment of our gene. Okay, from here on out, this information is not on the lecture sheet, but I'd strongly recommend writing it down. Okay, I'm gonna use the term homozygous, heterozygous. Homozygous, the prefix homo, means that the alleles are identical. So when I use like big T, big T, little t, little t, those would be symbols, that's homozygous. Heterozygous, if I look at the T's, I'd have one capital and one lowercase. Alleles are different. So here it is illustrated. So two big P's, homozygous dominant. Two little A's, homozygous recessive. Heterozygous, big B, little b. I can even write it this way, homozygous, two capital A's, two capital D's. It could also be lowercase, as long as they're the same. Heterozygous, here I've got big A, little a, little e, big E. So same letter, one's capital, one's lowercase. Okay, some other terms, genotype, phenotype, and a karyotype. Genotype is the genetic makeup. So I need to can take into consideration whatever I'm using for my symbol. Is it carrying a recessive trait? Like the tall plant is carrying the recessive trait short. So I need to have all the genetic information, the coding for that. Phenotype is the physical makeup. What does it look like? I would have three tall plants versus one short plant. A karyotype is what scientists use to determine by matching up the chromosomes and pairs and determining is there an extra chromosome, is there a missing chromosome, and that's usually an indication of some kind of syndrome, disorder, or disease. Okay, a Punnett square. We're going to cover this more in depth. This is just an introduction to it. It's used to predict an outcome. That's all it is, predict an outcome. So, for example, here are my parents. Here's the female. Here's the male parent. And all I simply do is I move one allele down and one allele across, and I match them up. So two big A's. One down, one across. Big A, little a. Now, I want to point this out. I put this on here for a reason. Do not write it this way. I always want you to put the capital letter first because when we get to dihybrids, it's going to make your life easier and less mistakes. Okay, and then this would be two little a's. So I could write it as a percent. We'll get into percent fraction, different ways to write it. Okay, so this is the correct way how I want you to write it. So if I have an imaginary gene for hair color, B, B, capital B is dominant for blue, lowercase b, recessive for white. When I cross those out, big B, big B, big B, little b, notice how I wrote the capital letter first, big B, little b, and then two little b's. So my possible offspring from that cross would be this is my genotype, my genetic makeup. I would have two, one, two, half of the offspring would be big B, little b, or have blue hair. One fourth, so here's my pink one, would be homozygous dominant, blue hair. One fourth would be homozygous recessive, white hair. If I wanted to know just the phenotype of blue hair, I would look at the first letter of each offspring. I would have three-fourths of the offspring would have blue hair and one-fourth would have white. We're going to cover this more in depth. I just wanted to give a quick introduction to it, but we'll have lots of practice. Okay, so that ends our podcast, and I will see you next time.